So this afternoon, I'd like to start with the uh, basic knowledge of what um, our people were given from the Creator. All nations were brought here on earth for a reason. We even have creation stories that date back to the Big Bang Theory. And these stories were passed down to us through our elders and through our um, relatives that are no longer here today. So my opening title is Anishinaabe and Cree, the Nehio language and the original stories that were uh, given to us by our Muslims and Gokums, and how our language is so connected to who we are as Anishinaabe people, Nehiawak, Asnipatak, Dene people. Each of our tribes have our own languages, and we all have our own way of teachings, even though they're similar. The most common one is we all have that ability to pray, to pray to whom it was we were taught to pray to, even the non-indigenous people. They were given a way to pray and they were given these teachings to live by. So our teachings, I will call them creator's laws or natural laws. In the beginning, when Creator created us, there was four sets of laws. There was uh, the earth laws, the human laws, the animal laws, and the spiritual laws. Today, I'll be touching just a tinge bit of each and every one of these laws. One thing I will say for sure is that these natural laws, they are still here. Like the sun comes up daily, every morning. And our ancestors used to greet the sun with song and prayer, which is something we have forgotten to do as a people. So my little stories today I'm hoping that someone will remember. Someone will say, uh-huh, it's what my Gokum used to tell me. It's what my Mushom used to tell me. It's what my dad used to tell me, and so forth. So this is where um, I hope to take the uh, you people, your attendance here today. So like I said, I've spent time with elders since I was about seven years old, and that's over 50 years. When I was seven years old, lost our parents in a car accident, and our Gokum and Mushum raised us. My Gokum's name was Maggie French Eater, and her Cree name is Nawakis. My Muslim's name was Mike French Eater, and his Cree name is Uskanik. So I acknowledge them today, and I ask them to come be with me here today. When uh, our Gokum and Muslim raised us, they raised us through ceremony, because my Muslim was a sun dance maker, trading dance, he had the Eagle Sweat Lodge, he had so many lodges that there was a ceremony for every season of the year and year after year. We we're also privileged to go with my Muslim to um, a place called Small Boys Camp when it was first formed. One of his best friends and relative was uh, a man named Lazarus Roan. And him and Lazarus Rowan used to sit together 
and perform ceremonies and he taught Uska Pe Usak some of the Sundance songs and some of the other songs that we use in ceremony. A couple of years ago, I was at a Sundance in Kootenai Plains and I was setting up camp and then all of a sudden I heard one of his uh, songs because of the fact that uh, we were there at every Sundance and you get to know those songs as they're being sung year after year and on a um, ceremonial basis. So I knew his song right away and I went to go drop my, um, my bags and I said, I wanna go see who's singing this song. It wasn't just a couple years ago, I'd say it was about 20 years ago. But the story is that when I went to the Sundance Lodge and I checked to see who was singing, and here it was a young man from Small Boys Camp. He has now passed on. His name was Fred Roan, but he was singing my mushroom songs. And that made me feel so good. With that being said about song, and our connection to the songs is that these songs were given to us from Mushums and Gokums. These songs were not narrated on this earth plane. They were given to us from over there. And that's why the, some of these songs are so sacred and they cannot be recorded. They can only be sung at these certain ceremonies. There's opening songs, there's healing songs, there's prayer songs, and like I said, ceremonial songs. And then there's go home songs. Those of you that are ceremonial people, you will know the protocols and the, um, the way of uh, how we carry out our ceremonial life. The creation stories, as I was talking about, after the great flood, that was the recreation story. The life began before there was anything here on earth. And some of our stories and our legends go back to that. There is one story that comes out of the Anishinaabe people from out east. And that story comes during as far back as the Big Bang Theory, what the non-Indigenous people call it. When there was darkness, the creator sitting with by himself and thinking that he wanted to create a place where he could send his thoughts to. This story was told by an elder from out east. His name is Onabenese. So yesterday, before I left home, I did a prayer in smudge and asked this old man if I could use his story in spirit because he's not here anymore. When we pray with smudge, the spirits hear us. So when I'm gonna borrow stories, I always smudge and pray to the people who own those stories. It's very important to do that because a lot of people will try to take someone's story and try to make it their own. It does not work that way. Like each family, they have their own stories, their own, they have their own teachings, and those are so important to acknowledge. For example, when you're introducing yourself, my Munyao name is Doreen Daychief. So when I use my spirit name, I'm acknowledging my spirit guides. And then when I'm acknowledging my spirit name, I'm also acknowledging my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmothers behind me. Because we carry their knowledge, we carry their DNA in each and every one of us. So that DNA gets carried down from generation to generation. So it is so important for the students and for anyone else that grew up without language or culture that they first acknowledge who they are as an individual. 
They acknowledge what their identity is, and they acknowledge where they came from. Because each person that came here on earth was sent here for a reason. Each and every person in this room has a purpose. That they say we are only visiting Mother Earth when we come here on Earth. That we are spiritual beings and having a human experience. So when we acknowledge our spirit names, already we are honoring who we are as individuals being here on Earth. My Gokum used to tell us, before you were even born, you stood with a Creator. And you and the Creator spoke to each other, and you looked down on Earth. And you already said what you're going to do when you come down here on Earth. But as you are descending, the Creator, with all the love and kindness in his heart, takes that memory and puts it somewhere. He does that out of love because he does not want us to anticipate. He does not want us to be afraid or to be expecting this or that. But the way to acknowledge that is by, again, acknowledging your identity and your purpose and your spirit. That's how you acknowledge that purpose. And it's up to each individual to find out what that purpose is. Like we have a lot of people in this room that are so gifted. Some are good singers, probably artists. Some are good sewers, hunters, all those gifts that we have accumulated through ancestral blood are there. And we just have to acknowledge who we are as individuals to find out what our purpose is. I went to um, university because I knew that our languages are, were going to um, be lost, or lack of a better term, that we were slowly losing our languages. And with that, I like to um, quote what my late Gokum had said when she was interviewed back in 1990, before she passed on. This is what she said. With the loss of our language, we lose everything. We must keep our language. With it comes the teachings of the old ones. And it's the only thing that will preserve what is truly Indian, for lack of a better term. I would uh, replace that term with Anishinaabe, Nehio, or Anto Aisino. In our future, as a people, doesn't look too good. This was back in 1990 already. So we have to tell the young people that they must learn and keep our language, our languages. And it's quoted Maggie Frenchieter, 1990. So in 2013, I went back to university and found this program, Masters in Indigenous Language. Oh, I was so happy. Yes, I want to be a language warrior. That's because of what my Gokum wanted and because of um, what our ancestors have always said and have always known that our language is connected to who we are as a people. It's connected to our songs. It's connected to our culture. It's connected to the land. And it's connected to our way of life. No, I'm not talking physically but our way of thinking. Now I go back to that um, old man that talked about that story about um, back to the time when um, 
everything was in darkness. He said that all nations on in this world were created at the same time. There was the non-indigenous people, the black people, the yellow people, and us. He called us the red people. So each nation was given instructions of how to go about their lives in this world. The Creator had sat with all nations and gave them instructions of how to um, conduct their lives in this world. So the other three races were so happy and so excited to, to begin their lives in this world that they started running towards the four directions. And it was the red man that stayed back because he did not want to leave his grandfather, his mushroom, which was the creator. He stayed back and sat with him. And the creator had pity on him, knows him. You have to go do what you're meant to do on earth. And with that comes the story of how our people are so full of love, kindness, and sharing. In fact, in 1492, when Columbus first came, it was through love, kindness, and sharing that they were able to nurse Columbus and his men back to health. Because Columbus and his men were dying of scurvy and they were almost almost dead. And then it was the native people that nursed them back to health. Nursed them back to health, lived with the people for a year, and the next year Columbus went back to wherever he came from and came back with more people. And that's the part of our, our history as we know today. The other short version of this one is found near Medicine Hat. And the legend out of this story is where man was first molded out of clay, where he was created, and this one's near the Cypress Hills. To this day, our people regard Cypress Hills as a sacred place because this is one of the places of origin for Nehio people. You can see the face, you can see the earbud, Looks like an earbud, but it's really a oil well, and it's a road. Fortunately, it'll be the only well out there because First Nations has stopped the government from doing any further drilling around that area to protect it. So the one on the right is kind of a bigger version of this one here. But the one on the right, you can see the other faces. This one looks like someone with a mustache. If I went further this way, there'll be other faces. What our ancestors and what our Mushoms Gokums always told us, it wasn't just fantasy, it wasn't just legend. Our stories are written on the land. So I just wanted to show this, what I talked about earlier. And I already quoted my Gokum's message. And I uh, talked about the uh, four laws. The earth laws is, just to be brief, we only take what we need. The animal laws, we are all related to the animals. We do not harm our relations. We have respect for the animals. And I uh, just wanted to point out, throughout this time, since uh, the Creator gave us our laws, it is only the animals that still keep those laws. Their, their mating season, they keep. And the way they raise their young, they keep. It's only us humans that have to continuously learn. 
and have to be continuously reminded of who we are as a people. The human laws, under there we have parenting laws, kinship laws, and how to conduct ourselves around certain ceremonies, certain areas, there's all those human laws. Some of the uh, parenting laws are referred to as TP teachings. And some of the other teachings, as told by elders, are called Kihtipik Skona. And these are what are sometimes referred to as natural laws. For a person to seek that knowledge, they would have to take tobacco to an elder and go spend time with that elder and really get to know what those Kichipik um, Skona are. I was recently at, um, at a funeral in uh, Saskatchewan and I was happy to hear this uh, elder speak of uh, the old Cree. And he spoke of how we're supposed to live our lives here on earth. Like to love one another and to get along. Because we all go back to the same place, he said. And when we go back, there's going to be three questions that are going to be asked by the Creator. We all have to stand in front of the the Creator, he says. And those three questions are the responsibility of each individual to find out what those three questions are. If they really want to know, that's a tobacco question. I heard what he said, but it wouldn't mean anything if I didn't go out and seek it myself. The same way when we are at a uh, ceremony, or if we're not talking the language, it would not mean anything unless we experience it ourselves. If we understood it the, the best way that we can by sitting there, listening and observing, and having that respect. The sp- Spiritual laws, like any other laws, the non-indigenous people, they call them the Ten Commandments or the other nations, they have their uh, own set of laws that they refer to as spiritual laws. Again, that's a tobacco question and it's up to each individual and tobacco is the protocol. And when we do that, when we seek the knowledge, we are helping ourselves to finding to what our true purpose is here on earth. For me, I'm still finding out. I know I'm a storyteller and a language teacher. But like I said, every day, every week, I'm learning something new. Just this past summer, I learned that um, I didn't know what to do with this situation. There was a bear that was coming around my granddaughter's house. And she had a bay window at the ground level. And the bear would just come and stand up right there. Had bear bear paw prints on the window. And finally she asked her, her dad is from Ochi's. But um, Gary had his uh, dad that had taught him something years ago about bears. So Gary told my granddaughter, 
I'll go get some ash. Because my granddaughter told me, what do I do, Gukum? I told her, put berries out, out way in a bush. But they kept coming back. And like anyone, you feed them, they'll keep coming back, right? <laughs> and um, anyway, when uh, Gary went and gathered a bunch of ash, and he poured it on that trail where that bear was coming from. Then he poured it right around the house, put all those ashes around the house, charcoal, escutel, or ashes. Guess what? The bear didn't come back. It didn't come back at all for the rest of the summer. So that's a part of natural law that we forgot, but now we know. And uh, now my granddaughter knows, and she'll be teaching her children, and they'll be teaching their grandchildren. So that old man's teaching is still here today because the father remembered, and then he used it, and today it still works. So those are some of the spiritual laws. I wanted to share this story of how important it is to find our true purpose of who we are as individuals and who we are as Nduaisinwak, Nehiawak, and Anishinaabe people. A long time ago, our people made sure that there was ceremony for each girl that came into womanhood. To this day, we still carry on those ceremonies back home. Because those ceremonies are acknowledging who we are as women. The steps and the acknowledgement that we do during these women's ceremonies, this women's feast, connect way back to how the Creator gave us our natural laws from the beginning. Briefly on that one, when we do the Women's Feast, this is only one item I'll share. We have the, the girl that's coming out, step over the Women's Sage four times, and we're acknowledging four grandmothers. And it is said that these four teachings, these four um, steps were used during treaty signing. So when you hear the term, as long as the sun shines, as long as the river flows, as long as the grass grows, and as long as there's nail, we still use that teaching within our women's ceremonies. Because we are acknowledging the sun. The sun, the creator took a little bit of that spark from the sun, put it in our souls, our spirit. That's why we are warm when we are alive. The only time that flame goes out is when we leave this earth plane. And that's why our bodies get cold when someone leaves this earth plane. As long as the water flows, that's how we were born into this world. The water breaks when a woman's given birth. So that's the second step. The third step is we're acknowledging Mother Earth. So all these connections are there. And this is just basic information that I'm telling the uh, people here today, I encourage each individual to go out there and find out who you are as an individual. Your purpose here on earth, because each of us have a purpose. Even the littlest one, the littlest baby will teach us something new. Because it is said uh, the small ones are so pure that 
they can see spirits. That's why when we, um, when we first have our babies, we always have um, what we call a rat root attached to their moss bag because that rat root is supposed to glow and keeps the bad energies away. This is what was taught to us by our Gokul. And some of the um, teachings about parenting is that what is so important today, even today, if you have a newborn baby at home or you have a family member with a newborn baby, that unbiblical cord, the one that falls off, that has to be put out there on the land. They say if you throw that in the garbage, then that little individual will always be searching and looking for whatever it is that they're searching for. So we are taught to put it up on a tree or a sacred place. Some put it on ant hills so they'll be good workers, hard workers. I've always went to go put mine at the... Um, my grandbabies at the uh, mountains. I put it inside a sweat lodge. So they'll ha always have this memory where language and ceremony is important and to always acknowledge who we are as individuals, as Anishinaabe people, and as Nehio people, and all the other tribes that are here today. So I wanted to um, tell a short story about this picture. I had a late uncle. He was, um, for lack of a better term, a medicine man, a ceremonial holder. But he had the ability to uh, spirit travel. So one day he was, um, he used to always come and visit my Gokum and Mushal. That one day when he was visiting, I heard him talk about one of his spirit journeys. And he said, Oh, tipsku tengi to taikaun, is what he said. Then he said that the, the space up there was so vast, and he said, There's other worlds out there. Msi says, Ta he said. They're piled up like this, he said. After speaking to an elder last summer, an elder that had uh, passed on, and he was starting his uh, spirit journey, and then Creator told him to come back. To come back and tell that story about these four steps. So this reality is real. We have to acknowledge who we are as spiritual beings because we come here to the earth plane as spirit and when we leave the earth plane we will leave as spirit. And one of the other teachings that Gokum used to tell us was Always acknowledge the teachings, is what she used to say. What we hold in our hearts, that's the only thing that's going to take you. When we leave this earth plane, when we meet up with our Creator again, that's all He's going to look at is what's in our hearts. So the reason why I'm bringing everyone here back to that uh, story is because we have forgotten who we are as a people. We have. We have been colonized over and over again. But guess what? We are still here in spirit. And we know who we are. Deep down, we know who we are. 
as individuals, but because these teachings have been put aside, I will not say they've been lost, because there's a lot of families out there that still carry on these teachings and are still practicing these teachings. I'm happy to say that our community, where I come from, they were the last to ever sign treaty, which was uh, back in 1944, in May of 1944. We are part of Treaty 6, and Treaty 6 was signed in 1875. So our people ran with ceremony and song for over 50 years before they signed treaty out in Sun Child and Ochis. And to this day, we still carry on these ceremonies. And for the families that do carry on these ceremonies, we teach our young ones about these teachings. And mind you, we did have a day school in the community where we were forbidden to talk our languages. And with that mindset, there's a generation below me that weren't taught the language. That was a mistake on our behalf. But we are there now, today, trying to correct that mistake. Because we are still here, as long as there's still Anishinaabeg, as long as there's still Nehiawak, we are still here to pass on those teachings. We are still here passing on the DNA. And like I said before, with the DNA comes the cell memories of our ancestors, the blood memory of our ancestors. So we carry it in each and every one of us. We just have to find it. We have to seek that information. And the best way to seek it is to reconnect with the land. Even if you just went and sat on the banks of the river, put tobacco down, and spoke to the Creator, and what language that you know how, do your prayer. I want to know who I am. I want to know my language. Bring me to that path. You know, Mother Earth is so vast, she listens, and Creator listens every day. And those of our relatives that are around us, the animals, the trees, the plants, like I was listening to uh, Jesse this morning, Dr. Sylvester, where she said that the plants were calling her. I believe that because I have elders that spoke of similar stories. Elders also talked about dreams. Some of the dreams that we have, especially when we're dreaming of a, a loved one that I passed on, then they are giving us messages. They are giving us messages and to um, really think about those messages. Sometimes it's not put in clear black and white, but sometimes it'll take you time to figure out what that message was. When we have nightmares, or when we have good dreams, it's all a message. And our elders taught us how to protect ourselves even in these dreams. Because when we have nightmares, pokoi, your spirit has to get up you got to fight for who you are as a person. you got to be mindful. Say you dream of a, an ancestor that passed on, and if that one's a good message, then you be mindful of what color dress she was wearing or what color scarf or what color shirt. Then you go out and buy a print of that color, and you go seek what that message meant. Those are some of the teachings that we were taught. Um, are there any questions? I didn't hear the part when you mentioned when you're having bad dreams. 
Um, I don't know. I, I just didn't hear it. Could you kindly repeat it? Our Gookum told us when we're having bad dreams is to tell whatever it is to go away. Upme, bonehen. Like to send it away. Leave me alone. Some bad dreams are so vivid and powerful that where you can't even move. So when that happened, she used to tell us, think of the Creator. The Creator created everything. When you think of the Creator, it's right there. Yeah. That's what she taught us. So when my grandkids, my children, used to have bad dreams, I used to tell them, call Kukum, call Mashon. Call Creator, because our spirit is there no matter what. All the time it sees things that we don't as humans. But the spirit is always awake and is always aware of things around us. Like for example, if you feel good vibes or bad vibes when you go into a place, Listen to your gut feeling and to your spirit talking to you. When I say you need to reconnect with who you are, and the best place is to go back to the land. Even if it's here in the city, go by the riverbank or go by, sit by a tree, you know, give it tobacco. It can happen everywhere, anywhere as long as you're standing on Mother Earth. I just want to express my gratitude for your teachings today. They're very inspiring, and they've filled me with quite a bit of hope. Uh, as I'm entering into like a different phase in my life, and I'm really I'm an uh, educator in, in the university, but one of the things that, that I find really missing is we... We talk a lot at high level, theoretical levels, eh? But these kind of teachings really ground us as indigenous people in these institutions and remind us of what our true responsibilities are, and that's towards the continuity of our culture, which is through our language. So your talk today has just been incredibly inspiring, and I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. As, uh Teachers and educators, that's what we hope to do. That we hope to plant a seed and we hope to wake up someone's DNA. Oh, yes. This is what I felt when I used to sit with my Gokum. This is what I felt when I seen this or that. Because you will. No matter where you go, Sometimes something will just hit you. Uh, Non-indigenous people will call it um, deja vu. But maybe your ancestor was there before. Maybe your spirit was there before. And you'll just have that direct connection with that place or that person. So like I said, follow your intuition, follow your spirits. All of us have the ability to dream. So when a person says that, there's that disconnection between the mind and the spirit, the heart. So they're either doing something, drugs, alcohol, to create that disconnection. That's why some people will say, I don't dream. And that's so sad. So we encourage people to go back to the land. Like last summer, we had a, a group of uh, adult students that came out to a place called Manitou Lake in uh, Saskatchewan. This Manitou Lake is such a sacred place. It has healing powers. A young mother took uh, her son there who had bad eczema, and she approached an elder, what do I do? how do I do this? You put tobacco in the lake and ask for your son to be healed of that skin rash. She did, and 
made her baby uh, swim in that lake. Today, no eczema. And another one from Fort Capel. This is an adult. And he grew up with eczema all his life. He's in his 50s now. And last summer, he came there, swam in the lake for a couple hours because he really wanted to get healed. He swam in there for a couple hours. And this year now, no eczema. See, that belief, that mindset, that way of thinking is how we, we maintain that connection with the Creator and with who we are. And when we believe in what the Creator had naturally given us, then that, that healing is stronger. And that's another teaching that was passed down to us by our grandmother and our mushal. Each individual is um, at a different state. They are at a different part of their journey. No two individuals are at the same state. What I'm saying is that you need to find your connection of who you are, find your identity, and find that reconnection with the land the spirits. You know how some people say, oh, I hear the trees talking. Oh, I can hear the birds singing. Some people that are really gifted, they'll be able to narrate songs just by listening to birds, just by listening to the trees as the leaves are blowing, or just by sitting by a river or a lake or just by sitting in the mo at the mountains. They'll be able to, these, these gifts that have been uh, suppressed will start coming out. And that's the way dreams are too. We have to go back, is what the elders are saying, the ceremonial people. We have to go back and teach our young ones because right now, they have lost the language and they have lost the teachings. We had an elder come from a fasting camp. About five years ago, we were out in Kootenai Plains. And he spoke briefly about the grandfathers taking him on spirit travel. And he was shown different scenes. And uh, he said that on one scene, I seen a bunch of young kids and they're sitting there like this, hunched over like this, he said. And then the grandfathers told him, those ones are lost. You have to bring them back to the light. That's what he was told. Yeah. And when I looked this way, he said, I seen the light. He pointed to the mountain and then I seen a sweat lodge there. So these are the things that we need to reteach our young ones. The uh, young ones were taught right from toddler. Our Gokum used to tell us, talk to the baby while the baby's inside. He or she will hear you. Talk to it like it's an adult, because it's a young spirit. Probably knows more than you, she used to say. But as a young adult, how is that possible? <laughs> But as we get older, these teachings and the knowledge will come, especially when you sit down with an elder. I'm not saying I'm an elder, but I'm happy to say I'm a storyteller. And through these stories of what my Mushams and Gokum shared with us and other elders that I've worked with in the past 50 years, this is where all those stories come from. I'm happy to be a Cree teacher and a Cree instructor and to be able to share these stories with you all here today.